And now, everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Patrice Scanlon. Aw, thank you, guys. Thank you guys all so much for being here with us live. And for those of you watching us online, hello. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this panel is called Ask Me Anything. It's going to be focused on music production and mixing. My name is Patrice Scanlon. I'm a course director here in the Recording Arts Program. I teach a course called Project and Portfolio 3. It doesn't really tell you a whole lot. We do focus on music production and mixing, so it kind of works out. Um, please help me give a warm welcome to our panelists today. We've got Swivel. <laughs> and Marcella Reka. Hey. I did, I tried. And then we've also got Leslie Brathwaite. All right, so this is a chance for you guys to ask your questions. So th they'll be coming around with Mike, so be on the lookout for that. And if you're watching us online, you can also ask us questions through that as well. So while we're getting everything kind of stitched together and sorted, I just wanted to check base with you guys, see what you guys have been working on in like the last six months. What kind of genres have you guys been working on? I guess I'll start. Um, yeah, I guess the last year since I've been back, I, I'm kind of very fortunate I get to work in a lot of different genres, so i uh, done a bunch of K-pop stuff this year, a bunch of hip-hop stuff, um, a bunch of EDM stuff, pop stuff. Awesome, all so over the kind place. Kind of all, yeah, even done a country record this year, so wow, that was interesting. Wow, good for you. Yeah. I bet that was a challenge. It's like country hip-hop. Oh, okay, yeah. all right, yeah. <laughs> the, what about new, you? the new, new. The yeah. new, 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 right? Marcel, what about you? Um, yeah, I've been kind of bouncing around. i um, been working on some R&B stuff. I've uh, been working a lot with um, artists internationally from like uh, Pakistan, India, Dubai. Um, awesome. But the genre is hip hop, so it's interesting because they are rapping in their language, their native language. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've actually been tapping in in the country world too, so which is really awesome. fun because I love country. A lot of people are surprised by that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And what about you, Leslie? Uh, my life has pretty much been for the past year uh, Cardi B, uh -huh. <laughs> Pharrell, uh -huh. Beyonce, and Rihanna. That's been my life. Okay. All right. What a lucky guy. Yeah. <laughs> So, like mostly you. Cardi B. <laughs> mostly Cardi B, I love it. Um, well, I, I got you guys on the mics here. Um, one of the things I see in, in my class is uh, the delivery of their Pro Tools sessions, naming files correctly. Can you guys just touch on how, how important this is and that we're not being mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen. <laughs> We work, right, in a very uh, technical, creative space. So organization is everything. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's essential to your workflow. Um, you know, when you open up a Pro Tools session, you see the audio files in there. I mean, that you can kind of probably make out what some things are, but when you're getting further along, like in like uh, synths and pads and strings, Unless it's labeled, you don't really know what it is. You can see a waveform and be like, oh, yeah, I can tell it's a kick. I can tell it's a snare. Um, but it's essential. And then when you go down to vocals, you kind of need to know, you know, especially when you're dealing with, like, singers that are singing in all these, you know, two, three, four-part harmonies, you kind of have to know, like, what you're, you know, what you have going. Unfortunately, in the real world, we organize. You know, right, right. we do the organization. Mm -hmm. I don't... Very seldomly, actually, I, I, I am fortunate enough to work with an engineer by the name of Chad Jolly. Um, he's my partner at the studio. Um, he's amazing at that, like he does that. But if my outside sessions, I get all the audio, duplicate, 1.03, oh, yeah. all the way down to the end, top to bottom. And I'm literally just like, ah, you know. And one of the, one of the key things of, one of the key factors of being organized color coding, labeling correctly, making sure everything is routed correctly, it keeps you from making monumental mistakes. That is the one key factor of being organized. It keeps you from making mistakes. 
And it's easy to make mistakes when you don't have a system, when you don't have some level of protocol of how you do things, how you label things, how your s stuff is organized. And it's a huge, huge help when, you, when, you, when you're neat. The other factor that I've noticed um, just in general, it helps communication between me and the artist. I remember I was mixing something for Pink one time, and she leaned over and she was like, man, your session's so organized. I can tell that's my so-and-so. And she made a reference to something she wanted to take out. And it made our communication a lot easier. And that's happened with a lot of artists where they're able to communicate their thoughts based on what they see on the screen because they can understand it. The color coding makes sense. They can look at it and know exactly what to point to. So those are, in, for me, in my world, those are the two main factors of being organized is not making mistakes and being able to communicate with the artists a lot better visually. Thank you guys so, so much. So are we ready to turn it over to you guys? We got our first question ready? Here we go. Hi, uh, nice to talk to you guys. My name is Christoph Robinson. Uh, my main question is, how did your guys' upbringing make you guys into the producers and engineers that you are today? It's a good question. Um, for me, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I grew up loving music and um, I did try playing instruments and wasn't very good at them. Um, so what, what I sort of take from that is that you don't actually have to have this enormous amount of talent to be successful in the music industry. Um, I always tell people I don't actually believe that I have much talent, but I worked really, really hard to get where I wanted to be. Um, and so like I still can't play many instruments well or anything like that, but once I figured out that, oh, you can like hook a keyboard up to a computer and uh, you know, my high school program had a m computers and music. We had like a little mini studio in my high school. So that kind of opened this whole new world to me where before that I thought you had to be able to play every instrument to make a song. And then once I understood, oh, this thing called MIDI exists, this is, this is wonderful, and I can just mess around on a keyboard and fix it later, and uh, that sort of opened this whole new world to me. And then it just became about hard work and, and getting good at the craft. So. You know, but yeah, I always loved music growing up, and you know, my my mom shared music with me, and I always had a radio and boombox. I don't think I realized that our stories are so similar. That's insane, because I'm the same way. I grew up not having, um, not singing, not playing instruments, but knowing I wanted the creative background. I wanted to be create. I wanted to be a creative in the music business, um, but I was always around a, a, a music field household. Um, and I just, you know, I knew I just knew I wanted to contribute to music in another way, and you know, finding full sale kind of did that for me. So, I think for me, both parents kind of contributed. My dad more so on the musical side, where my dad had a huge record collection, so I would always be listening to his records and sneaking out at night. It'd be like three in the morning. I'm with the headphones in the living room listening to records, you know, repeatedly. I think with my mom. I think from her I learned a lot of the soft skills and a lot of the things that have really helped keep my career, the momentum of my career. Um, my mom was very big on how she treated people. She was very big on um, treating people um, the same no matter what status they were in. Uh, my mom used to work at a university and she was the admissions director in the, in the Virgin Islands. and. There would be times when I would go to work with my mom and in the summertime, and one day she would sit and have lunch with the president of the university, and another day she would sit and have lunch with the custodians and the cleaning people. And I always thought that was, I grew up always having that impression in my mind, and I learned that you, you treat everybody amazingly. And so I think that has helped in my career in that sense, in the soft skills and learning how to treat people and not, I don't, I don't treat any artist differently. The same way I, I, I react to Beyonce or Jay-Z and, and the same effort I put into their work, same effort I put into a brand new artist. Uh, hi, my name is Christian Bird. I'm a recording arts student here, um, month 12. Uh, I love all of you on the panel, obviously, but Marcella, you are just an incredible inspiration to not only me, but everybody in the industry, just what you're doing Thank is. You. A single mother just killing the industry right now is just incredible. She's um, an inspiration to me too. She's phenomenal. Us too, yeah. You're 
phenomenal. But in, in your behind the board interview with the Recording Academy, you talked about how um, Missy Elliott was your first gig. And you talked about how you failed. Um, can you talk to me about one, how that came to happen, like what, how that panned out, and two, how you overcame that? Oh, wow. Memory lane, great. Um, I know I love it though. So yeah, Missy Elliott was the first artist that I ever really worked with. I was an assistant in the room. Um, you know, it, it happened because, uh, well, that particularly happened because um, she called the studio manager and was like, Trevor, I'm 10 minutes down the street. I, wanna, I need a room. And so he had to kind of figure out, oh my gosh, I don't have enough employees. Can you do it? You know, so I ended up, you know, getting the gig. So I spent a lot of time with her. Now, what happened was her engineer um, at the time was late. I don't know, the guy was incredibly special. Like, <laughs> he was like, he called and said something about being stuck in the Everglades and the alligators and I don't know what, you know? <laughs> and so Missy, when she's ready to work, she's ready to work. I mean, that's just like, she, I, she's not gonna sit there and try to be like, Trevor, can you find me another engineer? She was like, Sella, come in here. I need you to record me now. So I was like, oh God. So here I go to try to record her. And sure enough, like I was not even remotely ready for the speed that she, for anybody really, I was really, real, I was really slow. Uh, I was trying my best to fly hooks and do all types of things. And I just wasn't up to par. So she kicked me out. She was like, I need you to get out. You messing up my vibe. And I was so devastated, man. I was like, man, I thought she was gonna fire me from even working with her. She never even mentioned it to my studio manager. I just felt defeated. So how I overcame that was, I remember, um, so Demo, you all know Demo. Um, at the time, Demo had a, uh, his own Pro Tools rig, which was like, in, like unheard of. Like nobody, at that time, like, they didn't even have like the LE versions. It was like you had the you had to have the full blown, and he had it. You know, like he had a full blown Pro Tools system, and so you know he was just like, the only way you can really do this is if you practice. You know what I mean? So we ended up doing like sessions like with local artists, and I was the engineer in the in the room, and I just I would I mean I was just going at it, just like practicing, 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 learning every quick key, learning how to any scenario that could come up. You know, and. I just really attacked that, you know? So then, months later, crazy engineer again, I don't know what he was doing, didn't come to work, and she was like, oh man, I guess I can use you. I was like, all right, you little, you know what, I got something for you. And um, she thought she was gonna get the same old me, and literally, like, you know, when we got into it, she was like, you know, at that time, like, I already knew, like, if she did the hook, I was already flying the hook, so when she was doing the next verse, she would hear the hook come in and she's like, oh, she didn't have to wait. She didn't have to, she's like, damn, you already did it. So it, it, that sort of, you know, I literally had to practice. You know what I mean? I had to take the defeat. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't quit. I just was like, all right, behind the scenes, I'm going to work at this. You know what I mean? And just any off time that I, I, I could have, I, I applied it to just being the best at Pro Tools. And that literally like changed my life, my career, you know, because once you know Pro Tools, like you're essential to everyone so yeah welcome cool do we have a question online we do we have quite a few okay, the first good. one uh jaden from fort lauderdale who is a music production online student who says that swivel you are a legend <laughs> thank um, you he wanted to know what is your what was your first major project and how did you make the connection to the artist um good question uh my first major project was fabulous so I graduated full sale in August 05. I moved to New York in the same month. Uh, I, ha I got a quick internship that I, we had talked about before uh, we started this. Uh, I, I didn't like the studio. I didn't like the music they were working on, so I quit that. And then ultimately, I, I uh, landed this internship with Duro, who owns Desert Storm Records. And so I was started as a runner. I was cleaning the toilets and fetching, you know, food orders and, and all the stuff that you do cleaning up. Um, and Fab was getting ready to work on his album, but for the first seven months I was at the studio, he wasn't working. But he, was, he would come in and do like a little mixtape verse here or something here. And we just became friends. Like I would be in the lounge. I wouldn't be in the, in the studio, but he would have to walk through the lounge to get in. And the first few times he came, he just completely ignored me and walked right by normal 
but then, you know, after seeing me four or five times, then he saw something was on the TV or whatever, and he would crack a joke, and I'd crack a joke back, and it'd be like a one-sentence ex exchange, and then he would go in the room, and I wouldn't see him for eight hours, and then he, you know, he'd be out. Uh, and then, you know, that sort of built up over the course of seven months, and then when he was ready to start his album, um, yeah, he, I don't actually know whether Duro chose me or or Fab chose me, because there was another assistant in the studio, and we were kind of having this silent war between one another over who was gonna get this gig. We knew one of us was gonna get it, and the, the animosity between us was like at an all-time high, because I'm super competitive, <laughs> Marcella knows this. Um, and uh, so I'm just doing everything I can to make sure this fool looks crazy, and I'm, <laughs> right? And it's funny, like Fab was working on a mixtape, and I would get to record him one day, and then, uh, the other assistant would get to record him the next day. And this is like a few months before he started his album. So we would go back and forth. Every day we trade off, like, I'm the assistant today, you're the engineer. Tomorrow I'm the engineer, you're the assistant. And I guess when it came time for him to do the album, somebody had to win. And uh, yeah, so, but that was, I mean, I knew what I was working towards. And so I made sure every day I went in, I was on time. I was there, the f I was first person there, I was last person to leave even days when I wasn't engineering and I felt like a little salty that somebody else was in there like taking my gig, I made sure that I was crushing it on the assistant side and, and was making sure the food came in hot and like <laughs> everything you could do so that when it was time for him to say, all right, now I'm gonna start my project. This is not just little verses here and whatever I have an album to do. Um, I need one person who's gonna be able to manage all of it and organize the files and carry the hard drives and all that. Um, he trusted me to do that, so I was very fortunate, and we're still friends to this day. So first, first client, and yeah, always, always have a soft spot for that guy. One of the most important things you just said, Swivel, is, uh, and I want y'all to really focus on it, is he was on on the days that he was doing the job he really wanted to do, but he was also on on the day he was being the assistant. And a lot of times what pe people's mentality is, they only wanna shine their best and their brightest when they're doing the thing they really wanna do. And all the other things they don't wanna do, that they, you know, they, they do it real lackluster and they, cause they're only focused on the thing they want. But the fact that you were putting in 100% on the days you were engineering and you were putting 100% in on the days you were assisting, that matters, so. Absolutely. Good question. Yeah, great. We got another question in the audience. Hey, hey, hey uh, I'm Gavin Rosa. I'm an RA student. Uh, my question is, uh, when you're making like an album or a song with a lot of transitions like uh, Jesus is King or Igor, how do you make uh, this, the album, the mix and the, the sound uniform but still unique? I mean, in my opinion, working on you're already unique. We sort of touched on this a little bit in uh, the audio uh, labs or whatever where we were listening to music. You might not always realize that you're unique, but everybody listens to music a little bit different, interprets it a little bit different. And so if you're the one engineer who's overseeing, you know, 12 songs or 15 songs or whatever, you don't realize it, but naturally you're doing things that other people would do differently. And one decision might not add up to a lot, but thousands of decisions over the course of a 12 song album does add up to a lot. And you will create uniqueness there. And then sometimes it's unconscious and other times it needs to be conscious. Like, hey, I like this element. Let me make sure I use that across the whole record in subtle ways so that when somebody hears it on song one and then they hear it again on song three, they're like, oh, I get it. That's what, you know. Right. Um, and I notice that a lot on like the, like Kendrick Lamar's albums to me are some of the best bodies of work. Um, because there's this like, there's, there's this patina to it that just crosses the entire uh, record. And Dre was really good at that too. So the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree there, but. Yeah, and I would say don't overthink it as well. Try to always rely on how things feel and if it feels right, don't overthink it and feel like you have to do something. A lot of times that's what people incorporate in their process and I think it steers them off course where sometimes things feel good, you know? Yeah. Leave, know when to leave well enough alone. Yeah, it's definitely an emotional thing. I think one of the 
best albums, uh, uh, you know, Kendrick Lamar, Dr. Dre, yeah. but the Future Sex Love Sound yes. album I agree. that Timberland and Danger produced. I mean, you can listen to that album from track one to the end. The transitions. Very that cohesive. Really, I mean, cohesive. That really, it tells a story, you know what I mean? And it all goes down to feel. None of that was a calculated move. It was just like them in the studio, you know, overextending the play and then like not wanting to stop it. And then like, all right, how do we now get this into the next song? You know what I mean? And, and it, was, it was an emotion. So I think um, I always try to stress the fact that even though what we do as engineers is very technical, um, related, it's, it's, it's so much feel. It's, all, it's emotional, you know? Um, and if you can really key in and, and hone in on that, it, it's just gonna happen, you know? And just to add one more thing to that, I wasn't in those sessions, but I would imagine closed team. You have a team of people who are all working, producers, engineers, whatever, and so it creates a cohesive environment. Whereas a lot of like hip hop records, I'm sure Leslie, you can speak to this, where you have 12 different producers yeah. working on one album and they're and different engineers and different whatever, and maybe you're only mixing half the record or a third of the record and then other people are. Right. It doesn't feel connected the same way. Whereas if you have one mix engineer, one engineer, one or two producers who are working together every day, you get this cohesive thing. Yes. Yep. You know? Totally. Yeah. You're welcome. Great work. Hi, I'm T Ray, R A, month nineteen. So I understand the significance of recreating mixes and reproducing tracks to kind of learn the tools of the trade. I want to know if you guys still practice that or if it's just a matter of calling the person who engineered a mix and produced it and asking a question about what they did on the record. Like, are you talking about uh, yeah, it was a record, record yeah. that you, like, if you hear a record you like trying to recreate it to yeah, understand to learn, how like, it was created? Yeah, I wonder if you guys still do that. I know you're all established and doing everything. Do that is a that? good technique. I, I recommend that to people who are starting out. I don't do that anymore. It, um, it might come a, up in a casual sense. Like, yeah. if we're all at Mix with the Masters and I'm yeah. sitting down with Tony Maserati or, you know, one of my other colleagues that I respect highly and look up to, you know, I might, like Manny Merrick, I remember me and Manny Merrick when had a conversation last year at a dinner in New York, and the Charlie Puth album sounds amazing to me, and I love what he did, and, and I asked him a question, a very technical question, I was like, yo, on so-and-so, what was the reverb you used? Was it the Valhalla? Yeah. And he was like, it was the Valhalla, and I was like, I thought it was, and we just kind of <laughs> geeked out of, so there's a lot of kind of light geeking out over certain things and techniques. And you can learn, I always learn from my colleagues, yeah. always. So yeah. it's and more I might even sense. sneak in and watch a video of his. Like, I just like to learn, to yeah. be honest, you know? But it's not to like replicate, I like to learn. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because his workflow, Leslie's work, workflow, and our other, like everybody works differently. And I just want to know like, I want to get out of my own box sometimes, you know? Because it's very easy yep. to get just in your own little space and not, and I need, I like that. I like to just kind of reach out and, and just try to learn. I'm always constantly learning. Music is one of those things. It's not like math where there's one answer, yeah. right? There's an infinite number of great answers to a song. And there's an, also an infinite number of ways of getting there. And so how I get there is different from how Marcella gets there is different from how Leslie gets there. None of the paths are wrong. And you guys are all going to do it differently. And none of you are wrong if you feel like the end product is where you want it to be, right? So that's, you know. Well said. Awesome. Another online question for us? Yes. We actually have two questions that are pretty similar, so I'm going to ask them together. Okay. Um, Chris from Indiana, who's an audio production student, um, wants to know kind of what, if you want to be perfect sound mixing and you're a beginner, what do you recommend being the first steps? And then the related question is um, uh, from Jaden, who asked a question earlier. Uh, he wants to know what are the best first steps once you graduate? So um, as far as sound mixing and what are your f best first steps to start perfecting your craft, one thing I always recommend early on is listen and dissect genres that you don't particularly like or listen to all the time. Because what happens is if you, you, know, if you grew up loving hip hop, love hip hop, you love hip hop, and you want to develop your mixing techniques, part of the problem is when you're trying to do that with the genre you love, part of your brain is still concentrating on how dope that last lyric was, <laughs> right. or how dope that drop was, or how dope that snare was. 
if I grew up listening to hip hop and I want to develop my mixing techniques, what I, I did that when I came to Full Sail because I met people from all over the world. I'd never listened to a Metallica record in my life till I came to Full Sail. And then I came to Full Sail and was exposed to that genre and I started really listening to the grungy guitars and all that stuff and I started realizing that there were different sounds and things that I was paying attention to because I was not paying attention to the music and the lyrics and all that stuff. I was only paying attention to the sonics. So I think as a good tool, I, I would guess that most people's brain works this way, where you listen to something that you don't particularly listen to all the time or that you don't necessarily like, and you'll focus more on the sonics than you would on the actual thing. So that would be my recommendation for yeah. expanding your, your palette. And I'll sort of touch on the second question. The, the thing that I always tell students when you graduate Immediately move to the city where the artists that you want to work with are. Because it's going to be a lot harder for you to connect with those artists if they, if they are living and working in LA and you are in you know, Orlando, that's not going to be an easy connection there. So just go to where the artists you want to work with are. Go to where the producers you want to work with are. Right now it's mostly LA, but there's obviously stuff happening in Miami and Atlanta and Nashville and a little bit in New York. But yeah. depending on the genre, a lot of that stuff is in LA. So yeah. uh, go to where the work is and make it a little bit easier on yourself. Yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. All right, where's our next question coming from? There we go. Hi, uh, my name is Sydney. I'm an RA student, and my just que my question was just: um, you all obviously work with really great artists. What would be your start to start working with um, the artists themselves, rather than just in one big studio being a part of that? Yeah, I'm not really understanding. Because um, you work with like artists by themselves as well, but you work with a bunch of like different people. How would you recommend to start doing that rather than just going straight into a studio and working with that or if you start there and then go from there? I think I can kind of, I think I get what you're saying. I can try and parse, yeah, the, parse this question. Yeah. So what, you, what you're saying is when you're working in a studio environment, you have access to these artists, whether you're a GA or runner, or whatever you're doing, you're in the vicinity of these artists, but how do you connect with them if you are working from home? You're, you don't have a studio job. You don't have that in. Is that, am I understanding what you're asking? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, I can only speak to my own experience. Um, I'm sure you guys have slightly different, although maybe ours are fairly similar, and I would imagine with Leslie as well. Um, a lot of it was word of mouth, but it started from being in a studio for me. That was the path that I thought made the most sense. So be in a studio, be around the artist, like I said on the previous question, go to where the artists you want to work with are, find your way into one of those studios where they're working, and then you will be around them. Then the next step is, you know, uh, be cool enough around them that after enough time you build a rapport with them, you build that relationship. At one point, you know, Marcella got thrown into the Missy session because her engineer dipped. It wasn't around. Okay, so you build that relationship while you're a runner, you're going to get that call. You're going to have that shot. And she got a few shots. Um, now, if you don't have that, the internet is a really powerful tool and people reach out to me online all the time and I respond. I respond to, if it's a, if the question makes sense and it's concise and it doesn't sound crazy, I, I'm answering every single question that I get. It's usually when someone's like, hey, what you up to? <laughs> I don't think, uh, well, I, think know, I think, um, you know, connecting with artists directly, it, it, you, you kind of, you can't skip the step, you know? You need to be in the environment. It's like they need to trust you, you know, with their music, which is like a baby. If you had a child, would you just let anybody just hold on to your child? It wouldn't happen, right? You need to have that relationship with an artist in order for them to want to work with you. Now, what's the best way? By getting your foot in the door, working at a studio, even if it's like not actually touching equipment right away, even if it's just walking in with a tray of co whatever it is, you know what I mean, food, drinks. Um, but at least they're seeing who you are. You know what I mean? You're, you're tangible. But there, nobody's, not, nobody's from, uh, I'm going to use Cardi B's camp, is going to be like, hey, um, 
can you record Cardi? No, it's not going to work like that. You know what I mean? Because she has to feel comfortable. Artists have to feel very comfortable. And there has to be a trust factor. Now, not to say, like, I've worked with artists before um, where I've never met them, but I, like, you know, I had, there was a name already building up for myself. And that happened because I was at a studio. So to reiterate, a direct connection straight for the artist, I, I never like to say that's never going to happen, but it's very not likely. Not likely at all. Thank you. We got one more over here, down in the front. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Sierra Gordon. Um, I'm an RA. And my question is, um, you guys work with both um, very established and successful artists and both um, amateur artists as well. So what are the qualities and habits that separate the two that you guys notice? I think the first thing I always notice is more of the seasoned artists. Um, they tend to trust a lot more. They trust that you know what you're doing. They trust your professionalism. Um, they got there through understanding that it takes a team. I think the more amateur artists, they they have a very um, skewed and incorrect version of how things really go. And so a lot of times the amateur artists feel like they have to be the most involved. They feel like they gotta have the most input. They think they know everything. And it's that's usually the, the signs I see with the amateur artists is because they think, like, I, I, I can't tell you how many artists have come in my studio, like, new artists, and they'll say things like, I'll be like, so, yeah, you know what? Go do your thing. I'll, I'll mix, and you come back and give me notes. And then the artist will say, well, I know that's not how Beyonce does it. Because they have this thing in their mind <laughs> that they think that's how it works. And I'm like, no, that's actually how Beyonce does it. She really leaves me alone. She really just, I don't, sometimes I, sometimes I can go a, a solid months without seeing her and work like on a Lion King album. I, ne I didn't see her one time. She was traveling and doing promo for the movie the whole time. So I was just getting quick notes. Hey, turn me up here, turn me down here, boo, boo, boo. So, but artists, a lot of the new artists, they think it goes a certain way and they build up all this stuff in their head and then they think they come and they know everything on the planet. And so that's the biggest, um, difference I always see with new versus established artists. Yeah. And humbleness, too. Yeah. I don't know what it is about amateur artists that feel like they come in the door without being humble. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's like you have an opportunity that you're, you're trying to achieve a dream, but you're, but you're not being kind doing it, you yeah. know? And when you work with established artists, like, I always like, thought, I love working with Usher. You know, he's been in the business since he was a child. But he's so kind you know like he'll say hi to everyone in the in the building doesn't matter what he doesn't even know what you do but he'll have a whole conversation it's not even just like a hi and leaves you alone like he engages you know what i mean and i love working um with artists like that and i always find that with the older artists the more established artists they just are just so humble and kind and then you work with some of the newer ones and they're just completely like you just wonder like who told you to be like this? Yeah. It's almost like a, a <laughs> SNL skit. Like, is this a joke? Like, I don't know. I'm just like, oh God, you know. But yeah, I don't know what it is about the, the the newer amateur. You have to help develop them in a sense. You know what I mean? They don't know, and I guess they they feel like they have to be uh, Quincy Jones and you know uh, Jay Z all in one. And it's just like, dude, just be who you are and be kind. Know your role. If you're an artist, we're not saying you can't have any input on anything. We're just saying, like, allow, you know, the producers to do out what they need to do, let the engineers finish what they need to do, and then let's have a cohesive conversation. But to keep stopping it at every moment, you're not, you know, that's really kind of create, that's breaking up the, the workflow. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Great. Uh, I want to jump to someone online. Sure. All right. We have a question from Sinatra. He is a recording arts student joining us from Jacksonville. Uh, he would like to know, how do you approach mixing in different genres of music? Um, I mean, I, I mix a lot of different genres. I, I don't really overanalyze it too much. I, I understand the nature of what the genre is, and uh, it just kind of has become an intuitive thing. So if I'm working on a hip hop record, I know how that kick is supposed to hit. I know how the snare is supposed to slap. A pop record, I know it's gonna 
you know, the, the kick sample might even be the same, but maybe the shape of it or how it's processed is a little bit different. Um, but it's not this like conscious thing where you sit down and you map it out and blah, blah. you just kind of feel the music and, and go with what's natural. And a lot of times you'll reference your other favorite songs in that genre. So if I'm working on a, you know, a, a future bass like EDM record, like I'm going to listen to my favorite future bass EDM songs, maybe just to get an idea of like, all right, how should I address this? Yeah. Um, and so that's like a, a really good way, but it, it's never overly thought out. For me, it's very intuitive and you just kind of, if you understand the genre, you can do it. Yeah. So if I can add to that, I always think about the genre and how it's consumed. So I'm going to give you guys a quiz, right? How do you think most hip hop and R&B records are consumed today? How do people listen to them? Um, listening wise. Earphones in the car. Great answers. What do you think? Uh, EDM music. How do people consume that? Exactly. Country music. Pickup truck. Pickup truck driving down. No, you're absolutely right. So think about think about how music is consumed. That's a, I was literally waiting for that answer. And you did it. <laughs> but no, you know, you think about people listening to country music and they want to take these long-winded drives and they're just, you know, they're getting in their feelings and whatever, drinking a beer at the same time, hopefully not. But you know what I mean? Like, um, I think about how music is consumed, right? So I, you know, I think about if I'm working on a hip hop R&B record, like I'm going to reference when I'm at a point in my mix, I'm going to start listening yeah. down, yeah. you know, in the car, on my headphones, on my ear, as simple as like ear, you know, my ear pods. You know what I mean? Because you know that's where your consumer is. EDM, you know that's going to be in the club. You know what I mean? So you need to figure out how you can get, if you don't have, uh, you know, great, you know, main speakers in your studio, figure out how you can get this in a, in a place where you're going to be on those PA, you know, type systems. And the country, you know, it's the same kind of thing, you know. Think about where your music is being consumed at and then, you know, kind of take that approach. You know what I mean? But that's... Something I always think about. Yep, I like that. Yeah. And uh, for me, I approach, uh, for me, when it comes to different genres, I approach it with respect in a sense of if it's a genre I'm not familiar with, I'll do some research. If I'm mixing a future-based thing, I will reach out to Swivel and be like, yeah, hey, yeah. bro, <laughs> what do I need to be careful, mindful of? Or I might even send him my mix and say, hey, can you put your ears on this? Or Tremaine does that all the time where he'll send me a mix if he's mixing an artist where, because Tremaine is, is very much entrenched in the gospel world. But every now and then he'll mix a hip hop artist or a trap artist and that's a, a lot of what I do. So he'll send it to me. And even guys that I respect, like Guru, when, when we're working on the Everything Is Love album, Guru will be like, man, let me send you this one track from the Jay-Z album we're working on. Just put your ears on it. I just want you to hear. And I'm excited because I'm like, yeah, I want to hear that new Jay. Yeah. I'm like, hell yeah, send it to me. You know? But I'm also putting my ears on it and giving him constructive feedback. And then with like whenever I mix um, Beyonce records, I always send my mixes or filter my mixes to um, Tony Maserati because she is, he is her favorite mixer when it comes to her vocals. Like she'll always say she loves how Tony does her vocals. So we all, all of us, Stuart, myself, Chris, Guru, we all filter our mixes through him just to get his opinion because we know that she loves, you know, and, and it even, it's not even with just people I respect, even like with Cardi B. Cardi B loves her recording engineer, his name is Evan, and she goes by every word he says, so my relationship with Evan is, I gotta make sure he likes it before I even send it to her. Right. And so, you know, it's always about respecting the genre and respecting people's, other people's opinions, especially people who are like experts in that genre. Great, great. So we got one back there. Where are we now? Okay, over here. Hello. Hey. Uh, my name is hey. Matthew Mix. I uh, got my undergrad in the music production, and now I'm in the graduate degree program for entertainment business. Um, my question is more geared towards Leslie, but all of you are welcome to answer it. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you for all your time. I do really appreciate you guys all being here and sharing what you have with us. Um, Leslie, when, when you were mixing Cardi B's latest album, uh, the bass line on pretty much any track just, like, seems to punch me through my chest. And I was wondering if you could please elaborate on any mixing techniques that you could share to help really make that bass punch. The first um, um, part of that equation is I always have to make sure that my listening environment is conducive to what I need to hear. So um, when, when I got word that we were going to mix most of it in at Circle House, I literally 
um, made sure they had the exact same speakers I'm used to referencing on in my studio. I mix on the Focal Twin 6 BEs and I use a KRK 12 sub and I just wanted that exact setup at Circle House. And then they told me they couldn't get the sub and I brought, I shipped my sub down because it was important for me to be able, because I know her music in particular in that genre is about how it hits the 808s. It's gonna be a ton of 808 stuff. I couldn't compromise on the sub part. I couldn't use a sub that I wasn't familiar with. So I went through the trouble of shipping mine down to Circle House to make sure I knew exactly where that low end was gonna sit. And that's about just not being scared. A lot of times, man, people will ask me, well, how do you achieve that? Or somebody will play me their stuff and it'll be like, what do I need to do? And sometimes it's the simplest thing, just turn it up. Sometimes it's just, yeah, 808 just ain't loud enough. You're just scared to turn it up a little bit. And just don't be scared to push, push it a little bit. And, and break a few rules and not always feel like you have to be at negative something and da da, da. I, I, As long as it sounds good and you ain't distorting and you know, you, you try to walk within some guidelines, but at the same time, it's about feel. And you know, you gotta, I always use the little unorthodox ways of like, if I'm sitting there and the speakers is blasting and I feel my jeans like shaking a little bit when it bumps, that's, gotta, gotta get that little, you know, Gotta have, if it ain't if your jeans ain't rattling when it's bumping, and it ain't hitting hard enough, you know. You gotta have those little things. Like so, the fact that you said it was punching you in the chest, that was the yeah, goal. Yeah. Well yeah. <laughs> so my name is Juan Pulido. I'm from Recording Arts. Um, actually, you know that music is coming like in different languages. You are working with people that speaks a language that you don't know. So when you're like recording them, how do you get a good take? How do you know that they did a good take in pronunciation, everything, and when you're comping and editing or anything? So I actually, uh, I actually, so I mix a bunch of things in other languages, and that you you presume that you're getting. So I've, I've mis mixed a bunch of BTS records and written them and whatnot, and so I don't know what they're saying most of the time, but I do understand how a vocal performance should be delivered, so I'll mix it in a certain way. When I'm recording, I hand it off. So one story, when I was working with Beyonce years ago, uh, we did a Spanish version of Get Me Bodied, I think it was. Uh, and we brought in a Spanish vocal producer to cut that vocal. That was the only vocal that I didn't cut when we were working on her record. Um, and it was for that reason, because I don't know what the, and you know, also Beyonce's not a naturally Spanish speaking person. I'm sure she understands some and, and whatnot, but um, you know, she needed a vocal producer in there to really make sure that she was doing it justice. Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to uh, serve her very well in, in, in that context. Uh, but then when it came time to mix it and I mixed it, it was fine because I understood that the vocal performance I got went through that filter of somebody who really knows what they're doing, right? I don't know if you guys have a different view on that. Yeah, but. and and a lot of times too, it's also what I said before too is relying like so. I had I've mixed a couple records for J Balvin. J Balvin was on Cardi B's album Bad Bunny. I've mixed records for Bad Bunny, and there's a lot of times I didn't know you know what I was hearing in Spanish. So I'll I call one of my friends. I have a friend who works here in career development. Her name is Stephanie. I call Stephanie all the time. Anytime I'm mixing anything in Spanish, and I say, Hey, can you translate this for me? Help me with the clean version you know, all that kind of stuff. And then she also will tell me how it, if she thinks it feels right or should I accent. She gave me some good feedback one time on, on, on I Like It Like That, which I happened to mix some of it here on campus. And she told me when she heard it, she was like, you may want to turn up a lot of the ad libs and stuff because in the Spanish culture, those ad libs and all the, you know, all the stuff that he's doing in the background really matters in a sense. And so that was good feedback. And so you rely on other people's opinion who, um, know the language, know the genre, that kind of thing. You're not just speak Spanish, so I don't know. I don't have that problem. She good. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. We're going to send her a yeah. K-pop record yeah, and then let's see how, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we have time for one more question. Who's going to be the lucky, lucky person online? All right. Who we got? <laughs> uh, Damn, this is what a letdown. <laughs> 
Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. We'll, we'll stick around and answer <laughs> questions after. This Maybe. is actually a great final question. This is Dominic from North Carolina. He's actually starting his audio production program on the 30th. Wow. And he would great. like to know, what was your best memory of your time at Full Sail? Aww. That's precious. Wow. I love um, it. I think my best memory was the very first moment that I walked on this campus. The very first moment I walked through the door, very first person I met was Melanie Sabino. She still works here in Building 4. Uh, the second person I met was Jay Noble. And walking into an environment where I quickly understood that the motto was accurate, that they were willing to take my dream seriously, and that this was a place that I can learn this thing that I love so much and I can learn so much more about the craft. I'm talking about first 15 minutes in the door was was best moment ever. Yeah. That's a really hard question because, but I can kind of overall say, um, it's really the entire experience because the support system that um, I had when I was coming here with um, not only the faculty, but even with the network of, of students in my own class that ended up being, um, great friends of mine that I'm still in touch with today and some that I have collaborated with. I just feel like that it's hard to kind of pinpoint a memory because the entire experience is the memory, if, you know, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and it's like every time I come back on campus, I still get that feeling. Like I, it, it never goes away. It's like, you know, like that feeling never goes away. The buildings and everything the, might be upgraded and new developments, but especially when I'm in building one. When I'm in that building, because when I came in 2001, that's like, none of this existed. Right. This was not absolutely, like it wasn't here. All we had was building one and um, the show pro building across the street from there, from the, next to the barbecue place. And so, you know, yeah, it, it's the entire experience is the memory. I'll sort of like maybe close this out and take a slightly different approach. I love coming back for, you know, this week, Hall of Fame week. Um, this is a really unique thing that no other school does that I'm aware of. And I, we didn't have it when we were here. And I love coming back to these things. I love having these talks and connecting with you guys on campus and, you know, just walking between the buildings and somebody's like, what up? You know, like we're coming back to sort of hand down that knowledge and make it just a little bit easier um, so that when you guys get started, you can hit the ground running. And so I always, you know, when I leave Hall of Fame week and I go back, I go back to my studio with like this new energy, um, you know, cause I can see how, you know, every year when we do these audio asset reviews, the students get better every single year. I like love it's hearing that. Thank you. You know, <laughs> like there was some amazing stuff that I heard yep. earlier today and, and yesterday. So. Um, I love coming back for Hall of Fame. You guys are really lucky that you have a school that that puts on these sorts of events at this scale. So other schools might have one person show up like once every four months. You guys have incredibly talented people in all career fields coming back basically on a weekly basis. I mean, we have Hall of Fame week when everyone comes back, but then there's like the, the BTS, the, the behind the scenes stuff and all that. So, you know, I love coming back for this stuff and, and uh, you know, I'm just proud of what the school has done and whatnot. So. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Swivel. Thank you, Thank you Masala. Thank you, Jim Thank Leslie. You. Thank you guys.